Good morning, everybody. It's really a great pleasure to be here today to talk with you in our Advances in Autism 2022 conference. The title of my talk is Translating Genetic Findings into Therapy, Searching for Convergence. And hopefully what that means will become clear as we move through the talk. Here's the outline. First, I'm going to introduce what I mean by genetics and to tell you that we're in the midst of a revolution. And I'll introduce the concept of precision health to you. I'll then tell you what genes have been identified and how they give rise to autism. And then I'll describe a little bit, again, it's a very short talk, about how we might think about moving from individual genes to biological understanding and treatments. And my disclosures are at the bottom, but they are not related to what I'm talking with you about today. So we're actually at the beginning of a revolution in healthcare, similar, but probably even larger than the antibiotic age. Medicine today is reactive population-based, one size fits all model of care. Precision health is predictive, preventative, patient-centric model of care. The goal of precision medicine is deliver the right treatment every time to the right person. And this succinct statement really encapsulates the whole ethos of precision medicine. And it was actually first said by Barack Obama when he introduced his precision medicine initiative. But of course, prediction is very difficult especially if it's about the future. So achieving precision health is non-trivial and it's gonna take a lot of work. What do I mean by this? And what are the major goals? So one of them is to improve diagnosis. The second is to improve prediction. Can I predict whether you have high risk for a particular disease in the future? Can I predict even better the outcome. Prevention, can I prevent a disorder? And then lastly, can I optimize treatment choice and avoid adverse reactions? And especially in a field like autism, where it's very difficult for us to provide prognostic outcome information when we see a child first at two years of age. This is, this is clearly a very important thing that we'd like to be able to offer patients and do a much better job than we currently can. So of course, another piece of this from a research standpoint is that if we can identify genes, we can understand disease pathophysiology better. In other words, what is the mechanism of disease? And that will inform all of these things above. At UCLA, I'm the director of our Institute for Precision Health, and we have multiple signature initiatives shown here, including a population health piece, genetics for diagnosis in the California Center for Rare Diseases, precision diagnostics when people already have a diagnosis, like a cancer diagnosis, as well as using electronic and digital health in the Center for Smart Health. The notion, again, is healthcare tailored to you. You wouldn't wear just any pair of glasses. Your prescription is tailored to your vision. Why shouldn't your therapy? It's a paradigm that emphasizes the ways in which disease risks are unique and different, just like other more obvious characteristics. And there are two major drivers of this. Dramatically decreasing DNA sequencing costs have altered the approach to human disease as computer power increases. And what's shown here on the left is um, the um, um, Moore's Law. This is the line, Gordon Moore, the president of Intel, founder of Intel, said that the number of transistors on a chip would double every 18 months. So that's an exponential doubling. But we can see here, this in red is the cost of sequencing, the actual cost. And one can see it's dropped precipitously, faster than an exponential, it's because of new technologies. The combination of this decrease in cost and increase in computer power, which not only enables to 
us to analyze, to analyze whole genomes. It enables us to collect a whole host of data points, analyzing big data to do true artificial intelligence and machine learning. The result is that we're gonna have millions of genomes sequenced and the power to analyze them. So we're at the beginning of what will be an explosion of genetic discovery across populations. Fact, even in autism, five years ago, there were no genome sequence. And now our group in collaboration with several others has sequenced almost 10,000. By having more genomes, we get a more accurate understanding of human disease. So one of the, you could say paradoxes here is that to understand the individual, we have to have large numbers of people. To know what's unique about you, we need to be able to compare you to large numbers of other people. This is gonna to lead to new drug targets and already has, prevention, diagnosis and prognosis and optimizing treatment as I mentioned before. Now this wouldn't really mean anything if autism and other allied neuropsychiatric disorders didn't have substantial genetic components. So this is shown here. First of all, on the left in A, I'm showing a graph for the prevalence. These are not rare conditions. Even autism, one in 60. In B and C, I'm showing two different ways of measuring heritability. The first, just by looking at twins, monozygotic twins, that is identical twins, share 100% of their DNA. Dizygotic twins, 50%. And therefore, if something is more likely to coexist in two twins that are monozygotic than dizygotic twins, it has a higher genetic component. We can also look at families and understand how, the, how your familial relationship is, and genetic relationship is related to the probability of you sharing a disease. So using both of those, we can see autism, which is in the green right here, has approximately a 60% mean heritability based on family studies, but a very wide confidence range. In fact, we estimate the heritability is more like 70 or 80% now. This is uh, six years ago. We can also use DNA markers called SNPs to measure the heritability based on the actual genetic markers. And this shows a very similar pattern in autism. Another feature of genetics is that it depends on statistics. So what I'm showing here is for each of these diseases, and this is 2015, the number of genetic loci, that is regions of the chromosome that have been associated with disease. We can see schizophrenia had over 108, now it has over 300. But the point is it was on the y-axis is the number of patients involved in those studies. And one can see that there is a relationship between the number of patients and the number of loci. So to have sufficient power, we need large numbers of patients. And fortunately in autism, the patients in our genetic studies, the numbers have been increasing remarkably. And this has led to a rapid growth in our understanding of autism risk genes. This is a paper from Thomas Bergeron in 2017 that really says it all in many ways. You can see the genes that are being identified at different times. And what's happening is an exponential increase. Here, um, this is the number of genes in Safari, the Simons Foundation. And these are not all high confidence autism genes, but I would say right now, about a third of these are very high confidence. That is virtually certain to be autism causal genes. Why have we made this increase? Why do we have so many genes? Number one, it's because of technology. As we've increased and the technology has moved ahead from simple karyotyping, that is looking under a microscope at chromosome, to now whole genome sequencing. And this is shown here in an older paper that I wrote that this technology as it moves ahead, gives us more and more resolution and the ability to find more and more genes, but also our sample sizes have also increased. And again, to emphasize this more, I'll give you a little bit more background in the next slide, but I wanna make a couple points here. 
One um, is that most of these genes, mutations in the most of these genes shown here are sufficient to cause a neurodevelopmental disorder, but many of them aren't specific. In other words, they might cause autism. They might cause autism with intellectual disability. They might just cause intellectual disability and seizures. So these are mutations that are sufficient to cause autism, but some of them aren't that specific. They just cause a problem with neurodevelopment that then increases the risk for autism dramatically. And again, just to emphasize the last decade or so, Advances in Autism Genetics on the Threshold of a New Neurobiology was written in 2008, right at the beginning of this explosion. We had a handful of genes, but we knew we were gonna have an avalanche of genes. Little understanding of mechanism and major pharmaceutical companies were withdrawing from um, central nervous system research. 10 years later or so, we have the ability to identify specific molecular pathways in circuits in autism. More than 200 candidate genes, clear mechanistic models, major drug development efforts in autism ongoing. So what are these genes? This is just a cartoon that we published again a few years ago, but the basic rubric hasn't changed much. We just have more of them. On the left, what I'm showing are rare forms of autism. These are rare forms. They can be a medical genetic syndrome like fragile X or tuberous sclerosis or neurofibromatosis, something called a copy number variation or CNV, which is a duplication or deletion of a small piece of a chromosome. And they're usually named by the region that is duplicated or deleted, like 15Q duplication or deletion. And then we have single gene mutations where the protein is basically knocked out by a single mutation. What you can see here is that these are rare. None of them account for more than 1% of autism as shown in the parentheses. So this portion of autism, these major genetic mutations that are sufficient to cause autism account, none of them are more than 1%, and together, shown in this next bar, they account for about 10% of autism total. The rest of it is this green area, which is then expanded further on the right, which is, again, these rare genetic mutations. Now, I should make a point about these rare genetic mutations. They're also usually not inherited unless they're recessive. Because they have such a large effect on the brain, they reduce the ability to have children. And so most people with these mutations don't go on to get married or have children because they're so severe. They're de novo, like Down syndrome. So they're genetic mutations that aren't inherited from the parents, but occur in the germ cells, the sperm or the egg. And this is known to account for about 10%. We anticipate that as we discover more and more of these rare forms, it will account for perhaps up to 15 or 20%. So some of the unaccounted for up here is probably additional rare de novo mutations. Then we have inherited common variation. These are gonna be small things of small effect size because they're inherited. A single one can't cause autism, but combined, if you get dozens or hundreds of them together, you increases your risk for autism, pushes you over on the risk spectrum. So we have these kind of two different classes, the rare causal kind of mutation, and then the polygenic, the many genes acting together, each with small effect size. That's one way to dichotomize this, and we'll get to that a little bit later. So what we know now, and we can predict based on what we've learned so far is that there are likely to be many genes. We've identified about 200. There may be more than a thousand. In some cases, if you have polygenic score, they're highly additive effects. None account for more than 1% of cases. And there's something called strong pleiotropy, which means that 
an individual risk gene isn't specific to a, di a disorder. So for example, some of these mutations like POGZ or ADNP can cause intellectual disability without causing autism, as I mentioned before. Most of what we know so far is in European populations, white populations, but ra racial and ethnic diversity are critical to improving accuracy of genomic testing. And this is a paper from Zach Cohane and his colleagues in 2016 that shows that by not having a diverse population, people mistakenly called certain genes causal for certain heart diseases, but they were actually rare in the population being studied, but common and not causal in other ethnic populations. So really critical to have a broad swath of the population. Again, in autism, we've been working on this for the last eight years with our colleagues at Washington University, Johns Hopkins, Emory, and Albert Einstein in what's called the Autism Genetics and Human Diversity Project. We're recruiting uh, families of African-American uh, ancestry. And we've made good progress in this. And I hope later this year to have some of our first work uh, published on the genetics in this population. So to summarize, in an individual, you might have one of these rare causal Mendelian mutations. If we think of autism as a puzzle, and uh, here are the pieces, you could have rare mutations with a, that need an additional piece, either an additional small genetic piece, epigenetic or environmental piece, that really this remains to be defined. And then in most cases, it's a combination of common markers called SNPs in conjunction with other genetic and environmental risk factors, so very complex genetic risk. And again, if we wanna think about individuals, you could have many common variants, small effect size shown in blue, or the Mendelian model, one large, but it's likely that these factors in between with these additive effects also occurs. And the parents or the unaffected children are sub-threshold because they don't have sufficient number of mutations. And again, as I mentioned, there's comorbidity and pleiotropy in that many of the CNVs conferring risk of autism or schizophrenia, these structural chromosomal variations also affect cognition, causing intellectual disability. And again, when we look at those who have de novo mutations in autism, they have slightly diminished motor skills. So again, one can see here shown, here is the, um, you know, the rate, like the frequency of the mutation. And this is of a, of a de novo mutation in a particular, let's say child or adult with autism. So this would be 40%, this would be 10%. These have to do with the number of comorbidities. So um, delayed walking, seizures, intellectual disability. So if you have zero, your rate of de novo CNV is low. But if you have a complicated, severe course with motor dysfunction, seizures, and intellectual disability, it goes way up. So again, these large effect mutations affect brain development, leading to this pleiotropic effect much more substantial than just deficits in social cognition or mental flexibility, as is typically the case in the average autistic patient. So our challenge is we have a very complex genetic condition. Advances in genetics and genomics have identified many genes involved in susceptibility for autism. These genes provide targets for mechanistic understanding and therapeutic development. However, they highlight extreme genetic heterogeneity. Are we gonna to have to develop a specific treatment for each disorder or will there be convergence in specific biological pathways or brain circuitry that we can target? And again, just to make this concrete for you, this is one way to think about it. On the left are all these rare, you know, just uh, six rare mutations. In the middle are biological um, pathways, we'll call them. Um, on the right is a kind of global area of convergence. So the question is, where do these converge? Do they converge at brain regions and circuits? Do they converge at molecular pathways? 
or do they converge in these biological things like synaptic function, neuronal migration, abnormal pruning, or do they just affect a particular circuit like the frontal cortex? So now that we have hundreds of genes, we've been able to ask this very specifically. We can ask when and where do autism genes act? And I'm going to summarize this for you in this slide. Our first paper on this was published in 2013, and this has been validated now in several other publications. So what I'm showing below is a cartoon of development. This is birth right here. And this is all embryonic and fetal development. And this is a time when all the neurons are born and they migrate to their position in the cerebral cortex and they begin to connect with each other. And that, con and that connection kind of continues to be refined throughout the first several years of life. And what we find is that most autism risk genes have their highest level, that is they're most likely to have their strongest effect within the period of prenatal development. So early cortical development and the processes that they're affecting are transcriptional regulation. And this is what this is showing. This is about 16 weeks here. This is about birth. There are two major processes that are affected. Transcriptional regulation, that is genes that turn other genes on and off, but that are involved in the birth of neurons, which is called neurogenesis. And the other is in the connections between neurons called synaptic development. It's their ability to communicate. So we see these two processes involved. When we ask what regions are involved, it seems to involve the, the, the very superficial layers of the cortex. And this is very important because layer two through four are what are involved in connecting different brain regions to each other. And this fits with two decades of imaging research in autism, which shows long range disconnection as a fundamental issue in autism brain circuitry. And this work connects it to underlying genetic liability. That is genetics variation, disrupts cortical development, disconnecting different cortical regions from each other. So knowing this, how can we begin to develop therapeutics? What do we do? Well, we can begin to try to understand what each of these genes does. We can begin to ask questions about biological pathways and convergence. So I'm just gonna spend a few minutes just telling you in the end how we do this. How do we develop therapeutics? Now we haven't done it yet, so this is just a blueprint. Several years ago, Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize for showing that you could take developed cells from adult or any kind of patient, de-differentiate them into a pluripotent cell that could become any tissue in the body. It's called the IPSC, induced pluripotent stem cell. We can take this and make it into all of the different kinds of brain cells. And so we've used this in conjunction with our collaborators at Stanford to develop models for various rare medical genetic forms of autism, such as Timothy syndrome shown there. One of the benefits of this technology is shown in this diagram. When we use model systems, we can use mouse models, zebrafish, fly models. It's very difficult to study autism in a human other at the molecular level. And so these IPSCs really provide, whoops, quite a major, major advantage in that you can do things in very high throughput. In other words, I can test a lot of hypotheses and a lot of drugs. They get, you got a lot of mechanistic insight, and of course they're relevant to humans. We can use mouse models. They give you a lot of mechanistic insight, low throughput. It's a lot of work, five or six years at least to study one mouse model. And then the question is how relevant is it truly to human? So these IPSCs have really led to a revolution. And here's a more recent paper with our collaborator, Sergio Pasca at Stanford, who's really driven this revolution. This is 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, which is a major model of autism and to some lesser extent schizophrenia. Here, we grow these from 30 subjects in a dish, multiple lines and differentiate them 
until they're little mini brains in a dish called cortical spheroids. We can do extensive analysis of gene expression. We predict from the gene expression that there's gonna be a certain deficit in a signaling molecule called calcium. We can validate that physiologically in a dish showing that the depolarization that occurs when you give potassium is here it is normally in controls is massively reduced in those with the deletion syndrome. And we can further show that one of the genes in the deletion is sufficient to cause this problem, this DGCR8 gene. And then we can rescue the DR, the, this, this phenotype with a specific drug that, um, that is an agonist for this uh, uh, calcium channel. So again, this shows the promise of using these models, IPSC in a dish to not only understand the mechanisms, but begin to develop potential therapeutics. Now, how about mouse models? I've told you in many years past about the CNTNAP2 gene, which was found as a major recessive mutation. That is, you need a mutation from both parents. In the Amish population, it turns out to be the major neurodevelopmental disorder in that population, and it causes epilepsy, language delay, language regression, and autism. And what we showed in, an, in, in uh, more than five years ago now is that giving oxytocin, which is a social bonding hormone, it acutely normalizes social behavior in those mice. Oxytocin, however, has a very short half-life. So we decided, and again, this took six years studying the brain mechanisms in these mice to understand how oxytocin was working. We used both functional MRI, which is used in human, and cellular activity mapping in cells. What we found is that there's altered functional connectivity of specific brain regions involved in social behavior in these mice and over connectivity of social regions with non-social regions. The blue is the loss of connection, the under connectivity and red is hyper connectivity. When we give oxytocin, we find that this totally normalizes. So what oxytocin is doing is changing the local circuits and alters this connectivity. How does that actually work? Well, one of the regions that is known to be in, involved in social reward was one of these regions that was changing. So we reasoned that, and other groups had shown that it played a major role in social cognition. So we injected an oxytocin agonist called TGOT, or we did a physiologic stimulation of the oxytocin containing neurons coming from the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus that go all the way to this nucleus accumbens area. And we can stimulate them specifically using a method called DREAD. And when we do either of these, we get massive social improvement, showing that at least in this nucleus accumbens is a major re region mediating social behavior and that it's working via oxytocin. The question is, does oxytocin work in humans? Last year, there was a publication of a huge trial, the first ever in New England Journal of Medicine by a, by a large, very experienced group. They treated children three to 17 years old. There were 290 children enrolled, half treatment, half placebo. They got oxytocin twice daily, intranasally. And the outcome was a social withdrawal scale. There was no improvement. Does this mean that oxytocin doesn't work? No. In an editorial that I wrote, I explained that there are many likely explanations for this. First, huge mix of ages and the social bonding and how oxytocin works changes over many critical periods during development that aren't that well understood, but this wide mix of ages may have contributed. The dosing was likely not sufficient. Remember, I told you it has a very short-term effect. And in the mouse, what I showed you was a very short-term effect, about an hour and a half. If you're giving it twice a day, you're not really uh, giving it for that larger percentage of the day. The outcome measures, you know, social withdrawal, um, 
it's it's the best we have. But uh, the you know question is, is that really showing an increase in social motivation? Even more importantly, though, is that you can't just give a drug that increases motivation without actually giving the training. It would be like giving steroids to somebody who you want to bodybuild without any bodybuilding. So I think we need to couple the therapy with behavioral therapy. And I think we're gonna to need to do this going forward. And lastly, is this the correct group of patients? What I showed you was in a very specific mutation. We do not know that other patients have an oxytocin deficit. And we do not suppose or think that every autism patient is going to is going to improve with oxytocin. So it's again this precision medicine approach where we identify patients most likely to have the mechanism that we're targeting and then treating them. So what are those targets? Well, we now know that there's a change in connectivity, as I showed you. There are changes in the balance of excitation and inhibition, and different genes change that in different ways. We we can see that there are certain genes that act in terms of protein synthesis, others with the way that neurons act, um, adhere to each other and connect on the right and in the middle, things that are activity dependent. If we can begin to classify patients by their mutations or their composite genetic risk into these pathways, I think we'll have a better way to go. So the question is, can we target these pathways rather than individual genes? And one thing that the field is now doing is matching transcriptional profiles to find drugs. I can, if I can actually measure what's going on in a postmortem brain, I can identify compounds using gene expression in disease models or patient tissue just by pattern matching without even understanding mechanisms and identify drugs that reverse the pattern and test the drugs and model systems. And this is an area that is under rapid and extensive investigation. So I think there's a lot of hope for the future, both in individual mechanisms and in identifying convergent patterns and mechanisms in patients. So in conclusion, ASD risk has a large genetic component, but its etiology is multifactorial and heterogeneous. That's why we call it the autisms. Genetic studies have identified many dozens of autism risk genes, and we can capitalize on these using convergent evidence from studies in human brain and model systems to begin to elucidate the neural systems basis of autism. Autism risk genes converge to impact early fetal brain development. And this even get, is important because it also tells us where environmental factors are most likely to act as well. So genetic findings provide a starting point to create in vitro, that is in a dish and in vivo models to identify potential convergent molecular pathways for development of targeted therapeutics. But as I showed you with that oxytocin example, it's not easy. And I think we have to be sanguine and, and take and go step by step if we're to do this properly. Thanks for your attention. I have a large lab uh, that works in this area. Um, the work of many graduate students and postdocs shown in blue, my long-term collaborators, Steve Horvath and Giovanni Coppola, Sean Prabhakar, Ben Blanco, and Dennis Wall at Stanford. Thank you for your attention.